Welcome in to Locked On Knicks. The Knicks are in an 0-1 hole, much like they did to the Cleveland Cavaliers last round. The Miami Heat have come in and put the Knicks on their butts in Game 1 and taken Game 1 on the road. We're going to talk about what went wrong, how the Knicks can get better going forward, the health of Julius Randle and uh, Jimmy Butler, who was injured in this game, and more coming up next on Locked On Knicks. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome in to Locked On Knicks. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code Locked On. That's prizepicks.com, promo code Locked On. And we want to thank you guys for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day, whether you're checking us out on your favorite podcast platform or taking in the sights and sounds on YouTube. We appreciate you making us part of your daily routine. And if you want to become an everydayer, make sure to hit the uh, notification bell on YouTube or the uh, auto download function on your favorite podcast app. So you never miss an episode. We're here five times a week, if not more right now. So lots of lots of great content coming your way, even when the Knicks lose, unfortunately. Uh, I'm Alex Wolf. I'm editor-in-chief of Knicks site, The Strickland, which you can find at strict.land. He's Gavin Shaw, your favorite play-by-play broadcaster's favorite play-by-play broadcaster. And Gavin, the Knicks lost, like I already said, 108-101 to to the Heat. Things were looking, I don't know, sort of in control through the first half i don't know yeah. like i i left the first half thinking like sweet this is looking pretty good like things are kind of progressing the way they did with the Cavs, where the knicks sort of like got out running and and you know set a tone and really kind of like punched the heat in the mouth a bit and and you know said okay like we could we're gonna score all these points to transition like there's nothing you could do about it we might be hitting like like 10 percent of our threes right now but that doesn't matter because we could get inside whenever we want and score especially in transition and then the second half happened, and the Heat basically did the same thing back to the Knicks. And then the Knicks go on to lose the lead and eventually lose the game. Yeah, um, I, I'm a pessimist by nature, so I'm not taking credit for this. But I was a little concerned at halftime that the Knicks were only up by five points because it felt like they were playing incredible in the first half. Like It felt like R.J. Barrett for the fourth game in a row is like, you thought that was good. Watch this. Like outplaying Jimmy Butler for half a basketball, like impeccable decision-making. Um, hitting like a step back, extended elbow two, torturing Gabe Vincent. Um, and and then Obi Toppin was making some big shots. It, it felt like everything was really clicking for the Knicks. And yet you looked up and and the heat like slowly whittled away a lead that got as high as 12 to just five at halftime. And I kind of had this lingering feeling like, oh God, I wish we were up by, by 17 right now. Like this does not feel like as good as it should after a half of basketball like that. And then we saw a second half, Alex, where the Knicks just completely failed to, one, build on their strengths in the first half. To your point, they were 20 of 23 inside the paint in the first half. And and simultaneously, they just couldn't make a three in the second half. And if you were an opt, or, or excuse me, in the first half, and if you were, were um, they, yeah, they were three for 20 from three in the first half. And if you were an optimist, you would have been saying like, all right, the threes are going to start dropping. The paint's going to stay open. The Knicks are going to run away with this one once the shots start falling. And, and, and to your point, the shots never came. And the Heat, reacting to the Knicks dominating the paint, said, all right, we're just going to put three, four bodies in the paint. We're going to dare RJ Barrett. We're going to dare Josh Hart. We're going to dare Obi Toppin. We're going to dare Jalen Brunson even to make some threes. And outside of Obi, um, and even Obi was was pretty inconsistent in that second half. No one can do it. The Knicks finished this game shooting seven for 34 from three. Four of those seven threes come from Obi Toppin. Um, so just a horrific shooting game, Alex. And one where I feel like the Knicks left a lot of meat on the bone not going after Kevin Love in his 16 minutes on the floor. And at times, Jalen Brunson pretty blatantly passing up opportunities to go one-on-one with Kevin Love to just shoot a three-pointer in Jimmy Butler's face, which I didn't really get because you should be playing that dude off the court. Um, and then Jimmy Butler twists his ankle with six minutes left in the game. And, and the Knicks, instead of targeting, it seemed to almost intentionally not target it and kind of play with the feeling of, oh, that would be unfair. He's a little bit hurt. It's the playoffs. You got to go at the guy. And it just, it didn't happen. And, and the Knicks, um, I, I think, didn't make a field goal over the final five minutes. Let me let me double check that. Yeah, over the final five minutes of this game, Alex, the Knicks made one field goal. Um, so that wasn't good enough. The process wasn't good enough. And and Miami, a veteran team, um, deserved the win in game one. 
Yeah, I think actually process wise in the first half, you know, much like you said, like they were playing so well and yet didn't have enough to show for it. You know, I thought their process was great in the first half. Yeah. I thought they were they were generating tons of open threes. Well, you, you know, go it's three just, for twenty from three, like you can't complain about that. You're like, all right, we just got to make them. Yeah, exactly. And it, and it sort of felt to me like like it was like the Knicks were generating good spot up opportunities for Ob, mm -hmm. for Hart, for RJ, for Quickly, for Brunson even. And the Heat were just like doing all their little pull ups, and you know, Gabe Vincent just like coming out of nowhere to pull up and shoot a three and whatever, and. It felt like unsustainable on the Heat side and sustainable on the Knicks side, and yet then we saw that just kind of completely flip on its head in the in the second half, where suddenly the Knicks then were just not taking good shots anymore. They weren't generating good uh, offensive opportunities anymore. It just seemed like everything went out the window. And now, granted, maybe the Heat made some changes uh, that we're just not seeing as far as how they were guarding these guys, but it kind of just seemed like the Knicks like got a little lax with the ball. They, you know, the, the main thing or one of the main things that stood out to me was like, they were just every single time they drove into the paint, someone was getting a hand on the ball and stripping it. And it was yeah. blowing up possessions left and right. You know, Kyle Lowry was getting in there a bunch. Vincent was getting in there a bunch. Uh, Jimmy Butler, like poked the ball out from guys like eight times and that sets the ball loose and then gets it, you know, going out to the, it, it, even if the Knicks recover it, then, you know, you're, you're scrambling to be like, oh crap. Now we only have like eight seconds left on the shot clock. What do we do? And it just turns into a bad possession all around. And, you know, they, they just weren't being advantageous enough, I feel like, and also just not disciplined enough in that that second half. And that was sort of what led to not just their their foibles on offense, but then on defense. Like, I think the, the point that swung the entire game was in the third quarter. They let up, like, I don't remember the exact number, but it feels like it may as well have been 10 buckets in a row where Jimmy Butler just sprinted out ahead of them on the break and it was off of you know usually off a of miss but like you know it's just kevin love would get the rebound and then just whip it all the way down the floor and jimmy butler was already at the other basket and nobody checked him and you know it's like that's the sort of stuff you can't get away with you can't give up a a 6080 whatever run like that in the playoffs and and expect to survive you know it's just it, every possession counts every point counts and they had some great uh transition defense a couple times in the first half and then again, that all just went out the window in the second half. And I, I didn't fully understand like what happened to them, but it was just sort of one of those cases where it was almost like, and we've seen this happen with the Knicks before, where they stop making their threes and then suddenly things start to fall apart for them. And it, it just seemed to hit them extra hard in the second half of this game where like they weren't hitting threes, they weren't able to retaliate. And this team is so big on like that retaliation factor and like getting juiced by like, you know, matching some guys three with coming back with a three of your own and like getting the crowd pumped up and feeding off of that. And they just couldn't get that going. And then it seemed like that just completely took the wind out of their sails in the second half. Yeah, I think the I mean, the outlet passes is a great point. And it, it's something that we, we were talking about this pre pod and something you said, and I, I totally agree with it. Like they were operating to some extent like this was still the Cavaliers and we can win mm -hmm. the same way. And, and, and it's always this tricky balance in a playoff series, right? When, when you're going to a strength on strength matchup and, and for the Knicks, their strength, offensive rebounding for the heat, their strength, defensive rebounding, right? They're really good at it. And, and the Knicks in the regular season didn't struggle on the offensive glass, but they went from a team that otherwise was the second best offensive rebounding team in the NBA to an exact, pretty much exactly average offensive rebounding team. They're 15th in offensive rebounding um, in games where the, or, or the, or the number of offensive rebounds they got against the heat would have ranked 15th in the NBA. And yet the Knicks were still trying to send bodies, still trying to crash. But when you send extra bodies and then you don't get the rebound, that means they're going to have numbers going the other way. And particularly for the Knicks, like when, when you have Obi Toppin in there, who is your guy who's likely to get down the court the other end the fastest, or like I'd, I'd have to rewatch to know if it was him because I didn't really see that it was him. But if you have Josh Hart in there and he's not, and he's crashing the glass and he's not getting down the court and the Heat get the rebound, like all of a sudden you're asking Jalen Brunson or RJ Barrett to get back and you'd like them to get back. But even then, like Butler's going to have an advantage on those Hail Mary balls, which is kind of what I was getting at earlier. Like you shouldn't allow Kevin Love to be on the floor in the first place. You should put him in possession after possession after possession where he has to guard um, Jalen Brunson and look stupid doing so. Um, that being said, I do think if Julius Randle's back, like that might make the difference because then you're going to force the Heat to put Love on your center and Bam on Randle. And then you can play him off the floor that way. 
Um, but that was an issue for the Knicks, certainly. And, and then I, I just think in the fourth quarter, Alex, and we can talk about this more in a sec, like the decision-making kind of went awry for the Knicks where R.J. Barrett all playoff long, right? His process has been so fantastic. And today, like I want to do a deeper dive on this, like was maybe the pinnacle of it. He had seven assists in this game, had a number of other good passes where he didn't get rewarded for assists. These guys missed shots. Um, but it was a lot of hero ball down the stretch. Like you mentioned, all the strips Kyle Lowry had. He also had four blocks, which there was this great um, tweet um, that I put in my notes um, from New York Basketball. That, that was the most blocks he's had in a game in five years. Um, that was because the Knicks were like blindly driving, as you noted, into three, four guys down the stretch of this game. And the decision making that was so good. And the early, the passes early in possessions were so good. I can't remember. I want to say it was Benji or maybe it was Ariel. But like the key for the Knicks is, is passing before you, not because you need to pass, but because you've gained an advantage and, and, and kind of dictating the terms of that dance. And the Knicks didn't do that today. And I think that's where they, or, or at least in the fourth quarter, and that's where they really struggled down the stretch of this game. Well, we're going to talk more about some more of this dismal stuff from this first game, but also get into some positives. It wasn't all bad for the Knicks in this game, because quite frankly, if you do some quick math, if they made like three more three-pointers, they could have potentially won this game, uh, which is not unheard of. That would have only been like 30%. So there's there's some stuff to still talk about that they that you know could work in the Knicks' favor, and we'll get to that in just a sec. But first... I got to just remind you all that today's show is brought to you by Prize Picks. And I, Prize Picks is honestly like one of my favorite uh, things going on right now as far as daily fantasy games go. And they have this great new promotion. It's the $1 million daily super flex promotion for the NBA playoffs and finals. So every day of the NBA playoffs and finals, one Prize Picks user will win a chance at becoming a millionaire. One entry placed after 8 p.m. Eastern will be randomly selected each day. And whoever placed that entry will be given a six-pick flex with the following payouts. Six correct picks wins you a million dollars. Five correct picks wins you $80,000. Four correct picks wins you $16,000. And full details can be found at prizepicks.com slash million. You must opt in at this link to be eligible for the million-dollar entry. And once you opt in, all you have to do is play the game like normal and you could be the lucky winner. And how is it that you play the game like normal? Well, it's it's pretty simple, really. Uh, instead of the convoluted ways of daily fantasy of the past, this one is just picking against projections that are preset for you. And you just say, I think this guy's going to get more or less than that stat. It's sort of like setting a big uh, a big parlay bet, sort of, but in in the context of daily fantasy. So it's it's pretty easy. You pick two to six players, and if they they will score more or less than their prize picks projection. And you can win up to 25 times your money on any given entry. So download the Prize Picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code locked on. And if you deposit $100, Prize Picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, Prize Picks will give you $50. Don't forget to enter promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. All right. And we're back in. Continuing talking about this Knicks loss, and yeah, Gavin, I, I'm I'm with you as far as what you were saying at the end of the last segment. Like, I just there were so many little things that just kind of annoyed me with how the Knicks went about this game and and how they went about the end of it. It was like they they pulled out all of their worst tendencies all at once, and and for the first time this playoffs, I thought they looked shook. Like, and that's just not something that's happened so far. So far, I mean, other than. Maybe game two against the Cavs, although in that game they kind of just fell victim to a team that was like firing on, on all cylinders. And they never really like looked like they lost their composure in that game. It, this game they just flat out. Once the Heat went on that little run and then took the lead, it, it was just like the Heat were in their heads. And, and then they decided, okay, the only way back into this is, you know, and this is all happening separately in the minds of Jalen Brunson, Josh Hart, RJ Parrott, like all these guys all thinking separately, like the only way that this game is going to work out is if I take over and none of them were able to do that. And subsequently they also weren't running good sets. Like to your point that, you know, when you mentioned not attacking Jimmy Butler down the stretch, I mean, that was like the most easy money thing ever. I mean, I, you know, I hate to say it because it's like, yeah, the guy got injured. That's unfortunate, but if they're going to be, if the, if Miami's going to be stupid enough to put a guy out on the floor that is hobbling around, you got to take advantage of that. Like that's, 
like sports 101. Like that's not even just basketball 101. Like if someone is on the floor and they're not 100%, you attack them until they get taken off the floor because that's just the way that you're going to score points and win a game. And there was one possession that stood out to me late in the game where it was like RJ had Jimmy one-on-one and he they call a screen for Brunson to come over and set a, set a screen for RJ. And then RJ gets Lowry switched on to him who then strips him. And I was just like, this makes no sense. Like go after the guy with one leg, especially because RJ's a lefty and Butler hurt his right ankle. He was going to have to literally put weight onto the ankle that was like hurt. And it just, it made zero sense to me, like for a team that's so ISO happy normally to just all of a sudden be like, we're not going to attack mismatches anymore. And it's like this, it, one of the hallmarks of this team is creating those mismatches and taking advantage of them in, in ISO. And that's how they were one of the best ISO teams. That's how they got so many offensive rebounds because they did such a good job of like switching bigs onto like Brunson, letting him cook. And then if he missed, then having a big there to, to, you know, corral the rebound and put it back in. And it's just so many little things that that didn't work the way that they normally do down the stretch for this Knicks team. And hopefully it's something that gets sorted out uh, in the coming games because they just seem to be always like a half half step behind what Spolstra was doing as far as game plan and stuff, but then didn't even take the home run. Like he he threw like some 80 mile an hour fastballs right down the middle and they weren't smashing them like like, uh, you know, batting practice pitches. It, it just it was bizarre to me. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's to your point of of this Knicks team being like a little shook down the stretch of this game where it felt haphazard and and like you I mean like in any facet of life like you panic you kind of go to muscle memories like RJ staring down Jimmy Butler and maybe he's not thinking like in that second like oh he has a hurt ankle I need to go he's thinking like oh god that's Jimmy Butler like the guy who just knocked out Giannis and averaged like forty five points per game for a whole series I better I better go get someone else and it's like it's just taking the extra moment to think and it's. It's easy to forget, Alex, but this is like this is still a Knicks team that just does not have a lot of playoff experience. Um, outside of Jalen Brunson, like has anyone on this? I'm trying to think. Like, I don't think anyone on this roster has ever played in the second round of the playoffs before. And it is a little bit of a different thing when you're when you're looking at the guys on the other end. You say like Kyle Lowry, NBA champion, Kevin Love, NBA champion, Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, the two best guys on a team that were two games away from winning an NBA championship. Like, like this is a Heat team. Like you could say from a talent perspective like without Julius Randall obviously like I maybe I'd give the Heat like a slight edge with Randall I maybe would even give the Knicks a slight edge just because of all their depth but two teams that are relatively equal talent wise but the Heat have a definitive advantage um in terms of their mental game because of that experience and a- as good as Tom Thibodeau has been like Eric Spolstra is is kind of the consensus best coach in the world for five years running and and you saw it with his ability to like leverage guys like Kevin Love being on the floor and leverage his shooting and honestly Like, I thought Tibbs had a pretty good game plan. I thought the Knicks, for the most part, did a good job. But you saw too many points where there was just chaos at the end of a possession. And, like, multiple possessions ending with, like, Obi Toppin, like, trying to sprint from across the court to get to a wide-open three-point shooter. And you know what? The Heat are exceptionally well coached. So there's going to be plays like that. Like, it doesn't matter if it's, like, it could be the Boston Celtics next round with all their experience. Like, the Heat are going to get plays like that. Um, but Miami's going to make more threes than they did today over the course of the series. Like in the first half, they were terrible. That was part of the reason the Knicks were able to build a big lead and survive kind of a slow start on their own. And to me, the answer to that is like, one, they have to be very, very meticulous about how they attack matchups. Two, they just got to hit more threes because the Heat played, again, like essentially the Knicks defense against the Cavs. And, and for that to change, like, Part of it is just guys making shots. Part of it is personnel. Quentin Grimes only played 10 minutes in this game. And I think that's inexcusable in this matchup. Like he, he's the best three point shooter on the team. Unlike Emmanuel quickly, like he actually is the height. Like, like if a, a Max Struess is closing out on him, like he'll be able to shoot it over them. And with the fact that quickly just hasn't been hitting shots. Like I know Grimes was one for three in this game, but he also only played 10 minutes. He didn't get much of an opportunity and the Knicks were able to use him really effectively as a screener. When he was healthy against the Cavs, he had a great screen that got R.J. Barrett, an open layup, beating Bam out of bio in this game. Um, to me, like him getting more minutes, like over someone like Josh Hart, who played 43, and I know you want to match Hart's minutes second for second with Jimmy Butler. You got to give Grimes a chance. If not, I don't think the Knicks are going to win the series. Again, with the obvious caveat that if Julius Randle comes back and he's amazing, that changes the geometry, that changes the math for the Knicks. Well, and that's something to talk about in just a second because we should probably get into Julius Randle's injury because we did get an injury update prior to the game and Jimmy Butler's what that can mean for the Heat. I also want to talk a bit on the 
the Grimes point and why I think he should definitely be getting some more minutes uh, in this series going forward. But we'll take our final break and then come right back and get into all that in just a sec. All right, and we're back in to finish talking about this this game one loss. Uh, and as you mentioned to end the last segment, Gavin, I, I think there is really something still here. Like, like the Knicks have a lot of room to get better, uh, after this game, because this was pr- especially considering that second half, probably about the worst possible game that they could have played in maybe other than like that Cavs game two, which was also quite bad. Maybe one of the worst games we've seen them play in the last like four months, you know, like since like the year turned over. Or especially since they got Josh Hart, I mean they've they rarely put together efforts like this anymore, where they seem completely like just incoherent down the stretch and not able to to put good team ball together. But I think the Grimes is going to be a huge part of them potentially being being able to to turn this thing around against the Heat and you know take care of business at home in the next game and then potentially take one in Miami to get things back on track. Because to your point, he is their best shooter on paper. And like, I understand he's had a bad playoff so far up until this game. Uh, you know, the games he played prior to sitting with injury, he was not shooting well. And it now seems like that was probably because of the injury um, that he, you know, it's just something that was kind of nagging him that kind of finally kind of came to a point where it's like, all right, you have to sit now because you're just clearly not playing well. Let's get this right. But he looked, he looked spry. He looked healthy. Um, I was actually quite surprised to see him not back in the starting lineup because I, I think that's one change that definitely needs to happen going into game two is like get him back in the starting lineup, get that shooting back out there. And then you can get Josh Hart is your spark plug off the bench as well again, which is so valuable. Like it's so valuable to have a Josh Hart to be able to just call off the bench and say, all right, now go out there and just like don't stop running for 10 minutes, you know, and really punish these guys. Like do exactly what Jimmy Butler did to you in the third quarter of game one and just go out there and just be halfway down the court every time the ball touches the rebounders hands and you know go finish in transition because we saw that work so well for him to open the game but you know what could have worked equally well to open the game was having Quentin Grimes out there to shoot threes and his shot looked I mean despite going one of three I, I thought that his form and everything and his lift and everything looked about as good as it's looked ever I mean he's extremely consistent so it's kind of It's like, I don't know, he kind of always looks good when he's shooting the basketball, but certainly nothing looked off. You know, he didn't seem like he was leaving it super short or anything. It seemed like his form was true. And if you just give him some time to sort it out on the court a little bit, he's going to start making threes at like a 38% clip again, which could be huge for the Knicks in the series where they really clearly after today just need someone who could be consistent shooting the three ball and someone other than just Obi Toppin to do that. Um, And I think... The answers to that, one, Brunson will come back closer to how he shoots. And two, I think Grimes would make a huge difference there as well and give you a guy that could potentially give you that consistency from the three-point line and and also space the floor better for like R.J. Barrett and Jalen Brunson to get inside for you. Yeah, and like is great in terms of his ability, like I noted earlier, but like guard-to-guard screens because he has real gravity. Like if Josh Hart sets a screen like Miami's just going to double the ball every time and you can get good stuff out of that and like playing four on three and the Knicks I think because of the way the Heat were defending went away from that a little because they just kind of knew like all right they're just going to play off of RJ Barrett if you use someone other than RJ but that's kind of the reason why you want one of your two wings in there to be a shooter um, because if you have Grimes like you kind of got to stay attached to him or someone has to rotate over and that can create chaos in a defense um I promise we're going to get into some positive stuff. I I think we just got to go over uh, one last negative, and that was Emmanuel Quickly, who, like, I thought coming into this game could have been a real swing factor for the Knicks, Alex. Like, it just felt at points like they needed one more, like, like if they were going to go ISO heavy, like, one more guy who could cook in that respect. And look, Brunson couldn't hit a three, right? But you take the threes out of it, he shot 11 for 16 from two-point range. Can't really ask for much more than that. R.J. Barrett, again, sucked from three. You take the threes out of it, he was nine for 15 from two. Can't ask for much more than that. But they needed one more spark, just given the way the Heat were playing them. And Emmanuel quickly failed to provide that. 27 minutes on the court, three for nine from the field, one for four from three. The one three he made was a bank. Even more telling, like, and this continues to be a trend, only had one assist. He's basically, like, I'm, I'm pulling up his game log now. He's he's basically done nothing for the Knicks as a creator this whole playoffs. that. Like game by game, two assists, one assist, two assists, one assist, one assist, 
one assist for a guy in the regular season who was like exceptionally good in that respect. Like he, he just continues to look shook to some extent, continues to make mistakes that are kind of uncharacteristic for him. Like fouled Gabe Vincent on what ended up being a four point play, had another play where he took a highly contested three really early in the shot clock led to a Miami fast break. And I just think it's going to be tough to win this series. If someone like Kyle Lowry, who was, basically a non-factor for the Heat all season and had literally his best scoring game of 2023, Alex. If Kyle Lowry is like grossly outplaying Emmanuel quickly and Gabe Vincent is grossly outplaying Emmanuel quickly, I I think the Knicks are like, this is going to be an uphill battle because we're talking about a guy who was their third best player throughout the year. And granted, like RJ playing the way he is has like functionally replaced quickly. And it's almost like they did a Freaky Friday thing. Maybe they did. Uh, quickly should talk to RJ about that. Maybe they should swap back for a half or something. Um, but I, I think that is that continues to be a big problem for the Knicks. And this Knicks team could potentially hit a level we haven't seen them hit all season if quickly and RJ can get going at the same time. That just feels like a big if right now because it almost like there's a sense that quickly this guy who doesn't seem to get shook normally isn't quite ready for this stage yet. Yeah, I also think... I think it would be a good idea to start getting quickly involved with more on ball reps as crazy as that sounds based off what you just said that he's getting like outplayed, which I agree with. Yeah. G- give him the ball more, even when Brunson and RJ are on the floor, because we saw that work so well at times during, you know, the regular season and, and even, you know, I think there was some glimpses of it during the last round too, but when quickly's out there with Brunson, there's something really beneficial to having them kind of go your turn, my turn, you know, like having, because we've talked about this a million times, right? They both came up in similar development situations where they both have been asked to be on the ball, creating as the point guard and off the ball, playing off of a ball dominant player at different points of their career. Brunson with Luka Doncic quickly with, you know, with Randall, with RJ, with you name it, you know, he's, he's played off of a number of guys on this team over the last with Derek Rose, his rookie year. I mean, he's, he's been doing that since his rookie year to great effect. Like, I think that that's the way you get quickly going. And I think some of the best moments that we saw from quickly were like the few minutes when he was the point guard out there today. I thought that he did some good stuff as far as creating, you know, getting into the lane and setting up like situations off a screen with Mitchell Robinson, where he was making the heat choose between, okay, do you defend my very lethal floater or do you defend Robinson in the dunker spot? And we saw a couple buckets that he made that way or, you know, hit up uh, Mitch. I think he got Mitch on one of his lobs in that way but no matter what mitch was always a threat for that in that way and then you know that opens up if you throw him out there with like grimes and Hart, you know those are great cutters that he can you know look for if he's out there with rj and brunson those guys you know you can get them the ball in the perimeter and they can make a split second decision either to kick it to someone else or to take a shot themselves or to attack a closeout like brunson is great if he can attack a tilted defense as awesome as he is you know just breaking guys down every single time that's quite frankly, exhausting. And we see, you know, diminishing returns on that sometimes with Brunson. If he has to do that possession after possession after possession, he needs a couple possessions off here and there. Best way to do that is to throw him out there with arguably the second best floor general on the team. You know, eh, inarguably second best floor general on the team. The guy that can organize the offense the best other than Brunson is quickly. And the best part is, is that they can play together and, and be really effective as we've seen plenty of times this year. So I'm with you. I think I think they need to do a little more to get quickly involved other than just saying here spot up or whatever. And like, that's it. You know, there needs to be a more concerted effort to be like, no, let's get quickly going and in positions to set up his teammates in the same ways that we're doing for Brunson. uh, But maybe with a little more focus on distributing rather than just purely scoring the ball like it is with Brunson. Um, yeah, but Gavin, we, Alex, go ahead. Go we ahead. Did have yeah. someone, I was just going to say, we did, we did have someone on Twitter, uh, suggest, uh, it's time to play Evan Fournier over quickly. So I think that's a new, that's a new low, uh, for Emmanuel quickly, just that anyone, any, anyone, I, I don't care what drugs are on that anyone could say that ever. Um, that's, that feels like a new low. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, if you, uh, to that person, no, <laughs> it, might have been, it might have been a joke. It's hard to tell over Twitter, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you think that quickly, yeah, if, if it wasn't sarcasm, if you think quickly's getting cooked, wait till you see Evan Fournier out there against this Heat team, they would eat him like lunch. Um, anyway, Gavin, I think, uh, maybe it's time now. I mean, okay, we did promise we were going to get into more positives. I think it's more just constructive criticism that we've gotten into so far, but pretty clearly, there's ways that the Knicks can get better. Going yeah. forward, I think one of the biggest things, though, would be if they get a healthy Julius Randle back, uh, or at least an 80% healthy Julius Randle, 
Uh, someone, yeah. a Julius Randle is not just going to be a spot up shooter. Let's put it that way, because that's that's not going to be valuable. That's about as valuable as Jimmy Butler standing on the side of the court just as a spot up shooter. It's just not something that you want to be the case for for Julius Randle's like entire role. But he apparently gave it a shot prior to this game, which I was surprised to hear because that sprained ankle looked about as nasty as the first time as he did it. And it took him two weeks to get better off that one. Now apparently he's almost ready to go. Like a, a, a number of reporters were saying they put him through the paces like pretty hard prior to the game. And he really got a sweat going, almost looked like he was ready to go. And then at the last moment they kind of said, no, you know what? We don't think he's, he's good to go yet today, but that would lead me to believe maybe game two could be Julius's return. I mean, what do you think their chance? Like how much does it help their chances if they get back like an 80% Julius Randall? Uh, Cause yeah. I, I go back and forth. I, <laughs> Because I think that he did his best damage against the Heat when he was at 100% this year, and only because he was at 100%. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you you can't, um, like, untangle this question from whether or not Jimmy Butler plays in Game 2. And this was something um, our friend Ben Ritholtz I saw suggested on Twitter, and I'm totally in agreement with, like, given the weird schedule of this series, that Game two's Tuesday, Game three's next Saturday, there's, like, that's kind of a big carrot dangling in front of the Heat's eyes is saying, like, all right, let's, let's sit Jimmy a game. We already got our mission done here in New York. Maybe we somehow steal game two just because Spolster is that good and can pull off that kind of magic. And Kyle Lowry drops 45. But even if we don't, we go back home 1-1. And instead of risking Jimmy being hobbled this whole series, we have him at 100%. And we're already in a position that we like a lot against the Knicks. So I think that makes a lot of sense. I also saw another tweet from from one of the the sports Twitter doctors that Jimmy's turned his ankle a bunch in his career and always comes back freakishly fast. And a bunch of times has missed no games after doing it. So personally, like, I, I think the dude's like the devil, like not, not in like for any religious folks out there, not, not in that context, but just, just in the sense that like, you, you can't, you, I, don't, I don't know, is, is the devil known for not being kept down? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Wrong religion for me. But point is like, you, you cannot like, the, like the dude just like bounce and Mike Myers, that's a better example. It's like Mike Myers. Um, He just keeps <laughs> bouncing back. You can't kill the guy like Bill Simmons famous for saying the zombie heat. Like it's really the zombie Jimmy Butler. Like I think he's going to be back smirking next game, a hundred percent somehow. But if he doesn't play, if you're the Knicks, does that give you even more incentive to get Randall out there and saying like, all right, this is a golden opportunity. Let's, let's push all our cards in. Or, or like, if you're the Knicks, are you kind of staring them down? Like Alex, you and I were sort of joking pre-show, like could be a game of chicken where like Jimmy sticks a foot on the floor. Randall sticks a foot on the floor. Jimmy pulls it mm-hmm. off. Randall pulls it off. Like it, it's going to be interesting how they do it to your question though. Like if Randall's at 80%, like I kind of think you have to play him regardless because you don't want to go down 2-0 going back to Miami, right? This is your season on the line. We saw Randall, like, especially in um, that game five against Cleveland, like, figure out how to be aggressive, when to be aggressive. Like, I thought mentally he found his stride in this playoffs, and and he can he can toast this Heat team if they're going to put Kevin Love on him. And then if he can draw Bam out of bio, like, you just get to use him as a decoy because that, that means Kevin Love's on Mitchell Robinson, or they're putting someone even smaller on Mitchell Robinson, and, and the Knicks are going to feast both on the glass and in pick and roll if that's the case. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you. Like, I'd... I basically just need to see out of Randall. Like, can you, can you get to the basket? That's like thing number one period. Cause like for as much as that's a strength of, of Brunson and of RJ and of Josh Hart, like it still felt like the Knicks were missing some measure of being able to get to the basket in this game. Well, like, especially Brunson wasn't getting all the way there. Right. It was floating. Yeah. mostly like mm-hmm. where it like occasionally it was layups, but it mostly wasn't layups. And RJ getting stripped, like it was just, and I mean, granted, Randall oftentimes is not any better about that, but when he does switch into like full bull in a China shop mode, he does protect the ball quite well getting in there and gets all the way to the hoop. And then, you know, just kind of plants two feet and then just goes for like a standing layup at that Mm -hmm. point, you know, when he, when he's really building up ahead of steam in his best way possible, but the rebounding would also be helpful. I mean, Obi, Obi did fairly well. In this game, I think, as far as rebounding was concerned, he comes down with eight boards. They were all defensive. Did sort of his signature, like, like flying in to grab a rebound and, like, almost getting himself out of bounds and then, like, whipping it back to, to a ball handler somehow, like, finding exactly who he needed to find. But, you know, Randall definitely does a better job on the offensive glass than than Obi does and adds a different wrinkle there uh, with how aggressive he is getting, getting misses and getting putbacks. So, like, those are the sort of things I need to know he's going to be comfortable doing. If he's not going to be comfortable doing those things, then maybe you try throwing him out there as a decoy for a little bit. But yeah, I don't know 
for sure that the heat would fall for that. Like the Knicks fell for Jimmy Butler being a decoy today. Um, I'm pretty sure the heat would just be like, okay, well, just like we did with Obi Toppin and everybody else last game, we're just going to, you know, we'll let Randall beat us from three if he's going to, but otherwise I don't think he's going to win as a three point shooter. Cause that's just not his game. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's an intriguing question. I, I wish that I felt confident enough to say like, like if the Knicks had pulled out this game and won, I'd be like, definitely sit Randall game two. But unfortunately this game two now becomes a must win. Like, so you kind of have yeah. to pull out all the stops. You have to almost treat it like a game seven, you know, like, yeah. like Randall has to play if he can play, because if that gives you a, a 10% better chance of winning, you're clearly going to need it. Um, but I'm with you too, though. Like what we were talking about before we started recording, like uh, if Butler is questionable and Randall is also questionable, I, I would almost match the two of them because I do at least feel confident enough that without Jimmy Butler, I think the Knicks without Randall can beat the Heat. And maybe that's hubris talking because this Heat team just randomly goes off with all these weird role players that they found off the scrap heap at various points. But, yeah. you know, I think they could pull that off. Um, maybe that's maybe that's hubris on my part again. But Yeah, yeah you're, you're asking for a Haywood Highsmith 40 burger. By pretty way, much. By <laughs> Haywood Highsmith and you know Gabe Vincent will shoot like like twenty of thirty from three or something and break yeah, the NBA I, I record. Feel, I feel guilty even putting this out there. I feel like it's going to happen now. <laughs> yeah, now uh, now it's definitely happening. <laughs> yeah, well, 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 let's let's pull a pull a Kyrie Irving, burn some verbal incense, and end end with some positives because man, I I just want to highlight like how good the first three quarters were for RJ Barrett. Like I thought he was their best player, and it wasn't even close. And maybe that's because I take some of what Jalen Brunson does for granted, but man, Alex, like, I feel like we're seeing like the birth of a star in front of our eyes. And it, it's, it's inexplicable, right? Because it, like the pattern with younger players is typically what you see with Emmanuel quickly right now, where they're awesome in the regular season and they get into their first playoffs, particularly against a team like the Heat or, or a defense like the Cavs, and they kind of suck and they're not that efficient. And you say, it's okay. That was their first taste of it. Like you got to get bloodied. You got to get beat up. You take your licks, you come back. You're much better down the road. And, and and then you're better down the road and people forget about the times you sucked. RJ has been the opposite. He sucked all regular season. Like we can, I, I almost feel better about saying that now with how good he's been in the playoffs because I feel less guilty about it. Like he was terrible. He was disappointing. It was painful to watch. It was hard to defend him. You wanted to defend him as he was super young. There were still good flashes there, but it was mostly really, really bad and really discouraging after you gave the guy a hundred million dollar plus contract. And then he comes into the playoffs and all of a sudden, Guy looks like a freaking all-star. Um, he was incredible to start this game. Like that push shot he's been missing all year became automatic. And, and the ability to like consistently take advantage of Gabe Vincent on him. I don't think Miami's going to do that again. I don't think they're going to disrespect RJ like that and put Gabe Vincent on him because Tibbs did such a good job getting RJ the ball on the move. Like one of the early plays of this game, he ran this little pin down with Jalen Brunson um, handing him the ball. And then baited Bam out of bio into stepping up through a perfect hook lob to Mitchell Robinson. Got the step back jumper going, which we haven't seen from him in like two years. Went right through Gabe Vincent. Like that play that I referenced earlier where Grimes set a screen for him was so good because it made Bam out of bio hesitate for just a second. And RJ was able to burst by him, get all the way to the rim. He was a really willing passer again. And one little wrinkle that I really liked from the Knicks, they had Mitchell Robinson setting screens for Jalen Brunson up high so he could get a running start. But with R.J. Barrett, they had him setting screens lower just because R.J., like, that close to the rim, the Heat couldn't even send help towards him. And then R.J. could just, like, burrow his way past Gabe Vincent. And I think if if the Heat want to keep putting Vincent on him, the Knicks should go to that all day. Like, put R.J. at the free throw line, set up Mitchell Robinson there, and force Bam out of bio to make a choice. Because if not, like, R.J. is just going to bulldoze that matchup over and over again. Nine rebounds, seven assists, 26 points, like, I never thought I'd be reading that stat line out for R.J. Barrett in the second round against the Miami Heat. It's crazy. It's encouraging. Even if the Knicks lose this series, like that is going to be my one takeaway from this playoffs, like that this franchise is in a completely different place going forward because of what he's doing. Yeah, I, I thought he played a fantastic first three quarters as well. First half especially, I was like, man, he's really – like he has stepped up to the plate. He has stepped up and, and taken this challenge and is like ready – to level up here. And that kind of always happens against Jimmy Butler for him, but it was, it was like especially poignant um, in this, in this first half. I mean, I'll also give a shout out to Jalen Brunson too. Yeah. You know, I thought that honestly he makes 
two or three threes and, and we talk about this game totally differently. I feel like, you mm-hmm. know, the, the decision making was not great for anyone down the stretch. And I think that was in many ways just like frustration setting in that they were starting to lose this game, that they were losing hold of the rope, that the Heat were going on a run and making these shots and whatever. And, you know, it just kind of got demoralizing and they all got sloppy, including Brunson. But I thought that he did a great job soaking up usage. You know, he's just so he's so reliable that like he literally goes out there and does like what what Luka Doncic did last year, you know, or, or years prior with him on the team, you know, where it was like just goes out there and takes the shots no matter what, like, and always generates the opportunities. And I think that his distributing could have been a little better at times in this game. And yet he still walked away with seven assists too, and looked pretty good on some of those and was, you know, especially in the first half when the Knicks were really clicking, you know, like really doing a good job to find the open three point shooters. And those guys just weren't canning them. Like he and RJ both probably could have had 10 assists and in this game, if more guys had hit three point shots, Um, which is the unfortunate thing of, shooting 20% over the course of an entire NBA game. Um, but I thought he did well. I I also, I it seems like based off Twitter reception and stuff and, you know, people in the Strickland Discord and stuff like that, Mitchell Robinson played a little bit of a polarizing game, but I want to give him props. I thought that he did really well. I thought this was going to be a tough matchup for him, and it clearly was. I mean, it wasn't – I don't think this Heat team is as clearly uh, made for him to have a good – series against as the Cavs were like the Cavs are sort of just like written in stone like as long as Mitch does the things he's good at like he's gonna have a great series because Jared Allen's not scaring you beyond like six feet away from the hoop Evan Mobley is still really coming around as a three-point shooter but they also used him so little at the center that it didn't matter um you know whereas this team's like Bam is a legitimate threat at the elbow you know he's not a three-point shooter but he will punish you if you don't defend him at the elbow uh they also run Kevin Love out there center plenty which can be a detriment as well to a guy like Mitch. And I thought that he did a pretty good job of, of recovering, of sticking with Kevin Love and making sure that he didn't have too much of an impact in those minutes where he was the five and Mitch did have to directly defend him. Um, and I also just thought that Mitch, I, I mean, I, it kind of amazed me that Tibbs took as long as he did to get Mitch back in there late in this game when things were starting to unravel because Hardenstein didn't play the worst game ever, but Mitch legitimately had like Jimmy Butler, whose main strength is getting inside and scoring. He had him afraid. Like Jimmy got inside a couple times and didn't shoot because he just thought that he was going to get blocked by Mitch. Yes. He did a double pump at one point. Like, yeah, you know, it's just, you don't often see that out of Jimmy Butler. And I was surprised the Knicks didn't take better advantage of that. But uh, yeah, I thought, I thought Mitch played, you know, even though if you look at like the plus minus and stuff, like it looks like Hardenstein, maybe did better. And I think it was just kind of a factor of when they were inserted in the game and, and just sort of circumstance there as far as plus minus, but Mitch did his damnedest, I think to, to help this team the best way that he could. And I think if, you know, he clearly looked like he took a tumble that hurt him a bit in this game too. And said after the game, he's feeling pretty banged up and there's one hip is pretty, pretty busted right now. But if, if he can get that straight and, you know, stay healthy as well, I think he's going to make a big impact in the series as well. And, and I think he was well on his way starting today. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you too. And I, I wanted to shout out Brunson too, because like the Heat were conceding floaters and like he missed a few of them early, but then they started dropping in. He had like one play that just like was like my jaw sort of dropped. Like, I don't know if you remember it, but like Lowry and Vincent were, were kind of half double teaming him. And he just did this hesitation and both of them froze. And then he just kind of, it, it looked a lot like Donovan Mitchell, honestly, he just kind of scored it through the gap, got right to the rim, got a runner um that was that was awesome I mentioned like again like like especially like when they have Cody Zeller out there guarding Mitchell Robinson like like have Mitch just set screens really high up the floor for Jalen Brunson because Brunson is going to speed by Zeller every single time and like for the heat that is a lot that's going to be a big issue like or Zeller is going to have to play in a deep drop and then Brunson's going to have to start hitting threes I mean that that is going to swing this series one way or another for the playoffs now he's nine for 38 from three 24 percent Nine of those made threes, five of them came in one game. So in the other five games, he's only made four threes. For a guy who was an elite shooter all season long, that is going to have to flip for the Knicks. And then the one guy who did shoot well in this game, Obi Toppin, um, we got to credit him, right? Because like, look, he he was great in the closeout game, but he still, he never needed to start a game against the Cavs. Like we, we, we talked about it as a possibility, like this was sort of the test for Obi. And I thought all in all, like he passed it with, with flying colors. Like Tibbs said after the game, he thought he played great. And it was cool to see like Obi, especially in the first half with the way RJ um, was passing the basketball. 
like him actually used how he was supposed to be used. Like, like he set a screen for Brunson. Brunson got two on the ball. Brunson threw it over to Hart and Hart like immediately like threw it up to Obi for a lob finish. And I was like, yeah, this was kind of the vision when you drafted Obi Toppin, right? Like him as a rim runner. And especially like there were possessions where they had Kyle Lowry on him or, or Kevin Love on him. And like, and if they're going to do that, like they should use Obi as a, as a screener. And I know he's probably not going to get all the way to the rim if you have Mitchell Robinson parked at the basket and like Bam out of bio waiting for him there. But you can use him as a short roller to spray it out. But man, his shooting was absolutely crucial in this game. Um, did some good stuff defensively. Didn't really get out in transition, but I, I don't know, Alex, for like for two guys and like you and me who have been fans for him forever, like this was a great proof of concept, like against the heat that he wasn't taking advantage of out there on defense and that he more than held his own on offense. Yeah. And what was, what was the best part about it too, is that the Knicks used him differently than Julius yeah. Randall. And you know, they, they have shown a great, um, ability for doing that this postseason mm -hmm. where they're not playing Obi the same as they would play Randall or just sort of like stranding him on the perimeter and saying because that happened a lot I think during the regular season when Obi would come oh, in, yeah it's whole, it's whole career right yeah, yeah especially in limited minutes it would just be like okay Obi you're just standing over there you're gonna be like Steve Novak basically you're just gonna stay in the corner mm -hmm. and that's it and we're not gonna use all these great skills that you have like cutting and dunking and whereas in this game it was like it was like there was a number of plays. There was one I know that really caught my eye where Hartenstein even sort of called traffic a little bit. And, you know, Hart was driving in and Hartenstein mm -hmm. literally locked eyes with Hart and went like, like pointed right at Obi and cutting baseline. Then, and then Obi released and went in and it set up this yeah. beautiful backdoor lob dunk. Um, you know, they were running stuff like that where they were having Obi kind of act like he was going to sit in the corner and then do something totally different, uh, yeah. which is great. There was maybe a few too many times that they had him stranded with the ball in his hands on some of those busted possessions where it was like, okay, now you kind of have to do be Julius Randle, which you can't do. Um, mm -hmm. But other than that, I, I thought he played a fantastic game. And as you said, you know, it's sort of sort of proof of concept of like, this guy can be a starting caliber power forward in this league. And, mm -hmm. and I fully stand by that. And we've been saying that for years and I still think it's the case, but any rate, Gavin, I think we should probably wrap up. We've been, uh, we came into this show thinking like, man, what a crappy game. We're only going to talk for like 30 minutes and now it's been almost 50. Uh, so I think we're, there's still, oh, just, we that's exactly what we do, especially after a playoff oh, game. But just like there's meat on the bone for the Knicks, still meat on the bone for us to talk about this week. I think we are going to convene with the locked on heat guys at some point this week. Uh, another game on Tuesday, obviously, and then a pretty, pretty big lull. So we're going to probably try to get some guests in to talk about some stuff this week with you guys. Uh, but until next time, thank you all for listening, and we'll see you plenty more this week. Peace out, everybody.